I'm pretty sure that literally everybody knows what Jurassic Park is about by this point in time. They run it on TV pretty much year-round. There's a new movie out. They recently had a 3D release of the first movie, which honestly wasn't worth the money. And it's just a really popular film, and for obvious reasons, it's really good. However, not a lot of people are too familiar with the book anymore, which is, of course, what I'm talking about here, the differences between the two. And of course, first off, I will start with the movie, because that's the obvious place to begin, because that's where most people start off with this series. I saw the second movie before I ever saw any of the other ones, because the only one we owned, and they were pretty rare to come up for rental. And I only read the books when I was in junior high, because I'd never seen them anywhere before, because they're pretty uncommon books out here. Except at second-hand stores, who so just libraries don't have them as a rule. The plot for the movie is pretty basic. There's a new theme, like theme park zoo type thing opening up on I Isla Nubar that's run by a man by J named John Hammond. He brings a bunch of paleontologists and someone who specializes in chaos theory to the island to get their approval. Unfortunately, the power goes out, and there's also a related plot line which isn't too important, which deals with somebody trying to steal dinosaur embryos. And the power goes out while everybody's on the park, causing all dinosaurs to escape, and it just kind of goes from there. It's a very basic premise, but it's handled very well. I don't think, well, there's really no other movie that has done something like this. The closest I can think of that came beforehand might be Dinosaurus, which had dinosaurs on an island. But that movie, kind of nowhere near as good as this. The Jurassic Park just happened to get every single thing right. Despite all the technical problems. As it happens, the casting in this movie happens to be perfect. I don't know how who came up with the decisions for who they got, but everyone works out. John Hammond, who's a pretty important character, feels perfect. The guy who played him recently did pass away, which is pretty unfortunate. But he was the ideal choice for this movie, because he does come up as a fatherly character who's more concerned about people's enjoyment of the park than he is for the other aspects. He's not that concerned with money, he just wants to make this happen. The paleontologists are spot on. I honestly can't see any issues with them. The kids are highly irritating, but they're better than they were in the book. And Ian Malcolm is... well, it's Jeff Goldblum. I don't like him that much anymore, and I don't really like... never liked him to begin with. But this is probably one of the first movie roles that he really got that much attention for. Unfortunately, kind of screwed himself over by being typecast ever since, and doing the exact same performance ever since. But the stuff he was in before, he didn't really stand out in, and this is the first movie that he's actually fascinating to watch in. And he, again, was a really good choice for the character. Everyone works out perfectly in this movie, and I have no idea how they managed to do it that well. Considering that the new movie, which I have seen, the characters are just boring stereotypes, and they don't have anything interesting, or any they don't even work well together, but everyone in this movie just fits perfectly. Now, part of the strong suit of this movie is the special effects. With the book, you kind of can't have much of a comparison, but it is worth bringing up, because you could do something like Carnosaur, and have everything look kind of weird and rubbery and fake, or you could do what this movie did. This is the first film that I think actually used CGI right. They easily could have done stop motion, and they actually did have tests with it. But the choice to do it with CG made this movie absolutely groundbreaking. And the animatronic effects were pretty stunning, too. Honestly, Stan Winston's team really went above and beyond with some of their work in this, and I don't think it really gets that much respect in the long run, because everybody just focuses on the CG, which is still really good to look at. And I'd honestly say I enjoy looking at it more than a lot of the modern stuff, because it doesn't look too real. You look at it, and you can still tell that it's a, it's there. It looks like it's part of the movie. But at the same time, it's not in hyper-definition with a million different details. It looks a bit better because of that. And that's something really to be said for this movie. It was incredible when it came out, and still looks incredible today. The other two movies, not as much, and the third and the last one's kind of the exact same stuff you've seen everywhere else. But for this behalf of this film, the special effects really add to the overall appeal to watching the movie overeating the book, 
Because you actually get to see the dinosaurs. And that's just something you can't really compare. Another thing, of course, is the soundtrack. I haven't really brought this up too much with movies. I don't like talking about soundtrack that much, if I can help it. But this has some of the best musical scores you will ever hear. They're memorable, and even the horror themes to it, for like the scenes with the raptors later on, which you don't necessarily remember, they still sound great. But of course, the main theme is the one that everyone remembers, and rightfully so. It's simply one of the best themes you'll probably ever hear in a movie. And I'd be damned to find a good competition for it, considering that this incredible theme music they came up with, they waste. They actually do use it in the new movie. And they waste it. I don't really want to review that film, honestly, and since there's no book to go along with it, I don't have to. Which is a good thing. Now, I can't really think of any huge issues with the movie, either. Like, when we compare it directly to the book, there are changes, but none of them I felt were too detrimental. Most of the stuff that was cut out, honest, or changed, honestly, would have been either too hard to do, showed the dinosaurs too early, which would have ruined the surprise factor later on with some of them, and some of it just wasn't really that necessary. It's still a good book, but I, I will admit, I do skip just entire chapters sometimes in the story, just because I don't really care much for what happens in them. And you can go over it without missing too much. is isn't a good thing. The only glaring problems I can think of, there are continuity gaps in the movie. But most of them seem to be caused because they tried to do something directly out of the book, found they couldn't do it, but already filmed the rest of the shots revolving it, which is why there's some weird stuff that happens in some scenes. And of course, another big issue I do have might be how some of the dinosaurs are portrayed. They're not really that much better in the book, but the velociraptors are the same in both versions. Some dinosaurs were changed, and they do actually blatantly say the velociraptor was a small predator, sometimes in the books. But then they still have them being six feet tall for no actual explanation. When the book was written, Deinonychus and Velociraptor were considered the same species, so it was kind of excusable back then, but Deinonychus wasn't five, it was only about like four or five feet tall, it wasn't six feet tall. And they got, when they, by the time the movie came out, they knew this was wrong. Instead of just changing the name, they kept it, because Velociraptor sounds cooler, probably. And it really fails for me, just because they're not that scary. They're probably at their best in this movie. They kind of suck in all the other ones. But they're still stupidly inaccurate, and I don't really think they're that menacing. Yeah, they're smart, but you can shoot them. And of course, they do briefly bring up how all the dinosaurs are fully reliant on life. They don't have to produce lysine, so they have to have it given to them in their feed. They don't really discuss the feeding system that much in the movie, or well, really at all. It's discussed in greater detail in the book. And it doesn't really make sense how they get it into the carnivores, unless they're injecting the prey animals and the meat with large amounts of it, which is weird. And I kind of wish that would have been focused on. They also do bring up something in the book which doesn't apply to the movie. I don't remember it being that important. Having to do with the fact they're eating goat meat and the potential consequences of this. But I can't remember it, and I honestly didn't read the book for this review, because I've read it like four times in the past. Because it's a really good book. Except for certain parts. And I just kind of skimmed over just for any major comparisons, which will be coming up right away, because there's not much else to say about this movie. Jurassic Park really is kind of a cautionary tale about playing with genetics, and trying to do things that you honestly shouldn't do. But it's not really subtle with the message, it blatantly tells you this in one scene. It's more of just an enjoyable science fiction film to watch, it has amazing special effects, and even though the story still holds up really well to this day, unlike other movies that kind of were big in their time and you watch them now and you just can't get into it because it doesn't really apply anymore. But a lot of the stuff in this has never been done. We know a lot of it's inaccurate now, like how Amber, you cannot take DNA out of a bug preserved in Amber and make a dinosaur. But at the same time, it is a, lo a lot of it is believable just because there's a lot of actual science mixed in. Even if it's not the most accurate science, it's still really good, and I wish this movie 
it does get a lot of respect, but I wish certain aspects of it got more attention. Like the fact that, well, this is a pretty good example, actually, when we went to see Jurassic World. They had a little feature at the beginning claiming how Jurassic Park is the most accurate movie ever made and how the T-Rex was so amazing. Which is true, but people don't pay attention a lot to how all the other dinosaurs are wrong, pretty much, except for two. And the subtle lack of dinosaurs in most of the scenes honestly isn't brought up that much either. Most people remember the scenes with the T-Rex escaping, and they don't stop to wonder why there's not more dinosaurs. A lot of this imagining does have to do with budget, but I still think it's kind of weird that it's a dinosaur theme park, and they're barely on screen. It adds some suspense, yeah, and a lot like how it works in Jaws. But at the same time, you kind of want to see more. They tried to do this with the other films in the series, but I don't feel it was that successful in the long run, because it just would have worked better in the first movie, because it would never really been seen before like that. Normally, if there was dinosaurs in a movie, you'd have something like Valley of Guanji. Really good movie. Dinosaurs look really great. But you they're just kind of what you always saw in films. It's the same stuff over and over, and this was different. But then you barely saw any of the dinosaurs, which was unfortunate. Sorry about the fact the image is on its side. When I took it, it was right side up, and the program won't let me flip it. Jurassic Park, the book. It's honestly pretty different from the movie, and I'm not sure if it's honestly for better or for worse comparing the two. As I did bring up before, there's a lot of scenes in the book I just don't care for. But at the same time, there's a lot of really interesting stuff early on, which I think could have translated over pretty well. Some of it did end up making its way into the second film, confusingly enough, because there's a second book, they should have had it all based on that. But I'll talk about that when I find another copy of The Lost World. That movie's getting very tricky to find out here. And it's not really available at HMV for some reason. Now, with the opening sequence, there's quite a few differences. What we see in the movie technically happens before what happens in the book. We have scenes that involve the compies escaping, and actually getting onto the mainland and attacking children, animals, and whatnot, and somebody finding the half-eaten remains of one. And they're trying to figure out what's going on, where are these animals coming from. You also have somebody, the man who got mauled by the Velociraptor, ending up getting dropped off at a hospital, and they don't know what caused the injuries. Nothing's being said. No one really knows what's happening. And the only thing they find out is that it was caused by a raptor, and they just think they mean a bird. And then, of course, we made our, meet our main characters. There's a lot of differences with them. Like, Ian Malcolm is highly irritating in the book. All he does is rant about chaos theory, and it gets really obnoxious towards the end. I don't know why there's such a focus on him. He seems to be a favorite character in the book, but he's not as enjoyable as he was in the movie. Hammond's also pretty different. He still has the same kind of vibe about him. He seems like a really nice guy, but he also has this thing where he has a miniaturized elephant he brings around with him to show his work with genetics to try and get funding. And that's kind of weird. I'm kind of glad it wasn't in the movie, because it would have been silly and looked fake, probably. But it's a really odd thing to include in the first place, and it makes me wonder if there was maybe something a bit different planned with his character at some stage. Of course, there are more differences than just the characters. The park actually seems like a functional park when they get there. It has visitor, visitor centers, and one of the first things they notice is how everything has big, heavy iron bars on it. Which does actually lead to a scene later on with the Velociraptors chewing through the bars, which is pretty cool, I must admit. The rest of it, there's still, there's actually rides that are there in the book. And I don't understand, I can kind of get why they weren't put in, but at the same time there were some really great scenes that should have been acknowledged by at least one of the movies and were ignored every time. There's a really great example where there's actually a like a little riverboat ride to go through some of the enclosures. And the T-Rex ends up chasing them down the river, swimming in behind them. And I can kind of get why the scene was taken out of the movie, just because you can't really have a big soggy T-Rex in order to look weird with CG. But at least it could have been into the fourth one, where you actually do see the river ride in one scene. But of course they just kind of ignored it, and it remained one of the best scenes out of the book not to get transferred over. 
there are differences as well with the hatching scene. You don't actually have a hatching scene in the book. You have a scene where they see a new, like, a young velociraptor, and Grant is, like, manhandling it, trying to take a better look, because he's never seen one before, even though they're kind of telling him to just stop doing that, because he's distressing it. And the raptor does appear later on, it just kind of dies, but it was there, and it's not there in the movie. Again, this, I, like, this and some other changes of the dinosaurs, I can definitely understand. Just because it would have cost too much money, or it would have been really hard to make it look convincing with the le level of interaction they'd have with CG. Or how hard it would be to get, like, a small raptor animatronic to move without seeing any cords visible. That said, there were some changes that I don't really like that they did. That just kind of felt weird. One of the big changes, which I've heard reference that it was done so they wouldn't get the dinosaurs mi the Dilophosaurus mixed up with the raptors, was that they changed the design of the, the Dilophosaurus. They were actually pretty accurate in the book. They were the right height, about 10 feet tall, and they were described as having spots like an ocelot, and they didn't have the neck pearl thing, although they did shoot poison, which could be plausible. And I think it's kind of weird that they made them look tiny. Excuse the video in this part where it's kind of jumpy. My cat decided she wanted some attention and she's a butt and I didn't want to read. Well, it's a DVD. You can't rewind a DVD to get the exact footage you need. Well, this isn't the only dinosaur that got changed. For example, with the raptors, they do find some, some of the wild bred ones. They have chameleon abilities and they also see some that are actually the proper size in some scenes, which is kind of bizarre. And of course, the biggest change, other than the number of dinosaurs, which I'll get into in a bit, is the T-Rexes. Now, everybody knows the T-Rex from Jurassic Park. Everyone knows the roaring sound it makes. But most people don't realize that in the book, there are two T-Rex. Again, I can see this being more of an issue with budget than anything else. It would have been hard to make two big Rexes for this. The thing is, though, they won't work. They they weren't both adults. One of them was actually a juvenile, and that's the one that does most of the actually really the bad stuff, if you ask me. The adult one goes around killing other animals, and it's the one that breaks out and like attacks the cars, and it's the one that swims down the river at the end. Or, well, it's kind of in the middle. But the, the juvenile one's the one that kicks Malcolm in the chest, and the one that attacks people, and it's also the one that breaks into the building at the end and fights the raptors. I can understand, again, why they took it out, but then they combined the two of them together. And it's just a little weird that some of the really cool things the big Rex did never made it in. But a lot, most of the stuff the little Rex did survived. It would have been nice to see two of them in there, or for them to have done this maybe in the newer film and had both like the Rex and the Indominus Rex out at the same time and had the same kind of thing going on. But at the same time, I can understand why they didn't do that, because well, most people aren't familiar with the book anymore for some reason. It's just a, some, something that really disappoints me sometimes when I'm watching a movie that we didn't have twice the T-Rex. It's probably the best special effect in the movie and the best dinosaur, but I'm willing to let it slide. Now, one of the biggest continuity issues and most often discussed issues with this movie happens to involve the escaping T-Rex. And how its enclosure goes from being on ground level to having a massive cliff down it. And this can actually be explained in the book. Now, for one reason or another, they decided to change how the scene went down. Other than the removal of the other Rex, what happened in the book was the T-Rex actually picked up the car and dropped it in a tree. And, every, and like the ground was like kind of like described as being flat and level. It also wasn't as forested by the sound of things. And in the movie, it occurs to me that they probably couldn't get the animatronic Rex to lift a car the way they wanted it to, or they wanted to make it the scene more intense. So one way or another, the car ends up being pushed off the edge of a cliff, which is why there's this big issue. And the thing that makes it even more confusing is that later on, when they're trying to find the kids and uh, Grant, they end up kind of finding the car... Where you see them looking down the edge of the cliff, and then they're just on the ground. No explanation. You see them coming out of the trees some distance away later on. It becomes obvious to me that this is probably from when they filmed it 
they might have filmed the scenes out of order, which most movies do, and had it still planned that the Rex picked up the car. I've never seen the storyboards for this. I don't know if my theory is true or not. But to me, that makes sense for that being what happened in this to cause this mix-up. Because it does come off as a l not lazy, more of just they had other plans and had to change it last minute, and it ended up being kind of bizarre as a result. Some of the other errors, though, like the hands like leveling off the Velociraptor, I can't explain. That was just technical problems by the looks of it. Now, another change scene happens to be the one where they find the downed Triceratops. When they are going on the tour originally, you do see a lot more dinosaurs. There's one variety which I can't pronounce the name of and thus won't try that they see in trees. This was an older belief that these dinosaurs climbed trees has now been proven false, because it just doesn't make sense. And it's kind of neat seeing them included, but then not ending up in the movie. When they do show Nedry collecting the dinosaur embryos, most of the ones listed on that little like carousel are breeds that existed in the book that just never made it across. And originally this Triceratops was actually a Stegosaurus. They do explain that when it was collecting stones for its gullet, which birds do, it was picking up these lilac berries as well, and that's why it was getting sick. The explanation was cut out of the film, and it just would have bogged it down, but at the same time you can tell they were trying to do this, and they just ended up cutting it short. There is Triceratops that happen in the book, though. You see them earlier on. There's some, there's some of the few dinosaurs they actually do see on the tour. And well, they actually do see most of the dinosaurs. They even see the Dilophosaurus. But the first time they see them, they're just standing there not doing anything. When they see them again, they actually see the baby Triceratops, which was ultimately taken out. So they, what happens is after they find the kids... Grant, when they're wandering around, and, like all the dinosaurs are getting round up, he actually finds this baby Triceratops at a feeding station, and they're actually like playing around and petting it, and they kind of make a reference to maybe taking a ride on its back. There apparently was a scene that was filmed with them actually riding on it, but that would have been stupid, and I'm glad they cut it out. They did change some scenes for the better, such as that. And a lot of the stuff they did change kind of helped speed up the story. It would have been a really slow movie if all of the really detailed segments and everything did appear in it. It would have been nice, but at the same time, you don't want to listen to Ian Malcolm rant about chaos theory while he's high on morphine. That would have been boring and stupid. So they did make a lot of cuts for the right decisions. However, the ending does actually get a pretty big change, and I would have been curious to see it if they had done it exactly as it was in the book. Now, first of all, one thing I did bring up is the kids do change. Originally, the girl in the book is useless, and I'm glad they at least let her use computers. Originally, her brother just knew how to do everything. And between the two, you still want the kids to die for the whole movie. You just never get that in the book, either. Neither of them die. But there are changed scenes with the raptors. First of all, I'm pretty sure there were more of them in the book. I never did pinpoint the exact number. There is a scene where they run the computer test and shows them the numbers of dinosaurs in the park and how it always scans for the same ones over and over. When they put in a higher value, they find there's almost like 200 dinosaurs in the park, most of which have been bred in the wild, and a lot of them are velociraptors. But one of the other main things that changed are the scenes involving the raptors in the building. They do manage to trap one in the deep freeze, but then there are scenes involving poisoned eggs that Grant's throwing, where there's this toxin which was made just specifically to kill dinosaurs. And he's injecting these eggs full of it and rolling it towards them, and the raptors are picking up the eggs and eating them, or at least one of them does. Actually, I believe two did. I really should have read the book first, huh? But it just changes like that towards the end where I can kind of see why they did it, but it would have been kind of interesting to see these left in. But the other really big change is that they actually followed a wild raptor back to a nest that was like inside of like a like volcanic area of the island and find this massive den full of velociraptors. And it turns out that the raptors actually do manage to escape the island aboard a boat and get onto the mainland. It's never addressed in the second book never addressed in the movie, and I really wish they actually would have done something with the concept of this nest, and done it maybe earlier in the movie to prove the dinosaurs were breeding. 
it's just a really interesting part of the story that got cut out. And there's quite a few scenes like that that I felt were really fascinating, a lot of them involving the computer stuff, which were sacrificed. We still got an amazing movie in the end, but I think it's worth pe it's worthwhile for people to actually read the book after they watch the movie. Because there's a lot of stuff that you're missing out on that no one really recognizes that they are missing out on. The sec same thing with the second movie. The book's actually really good for that one. And a lot of it had to be changed over for, like, fan re references mainly, so I'm pretty sure everybody would have been mad if Ian Malcolm wasn't in it. But it's just one of the things where you should really read the book, too. In fact, E. Malcolm shouldn't even be in the second movie, because he actually dies in the book. They leave him to die. You don't get any explicit details on his death, which would have been kind of satisfying since it's so irritating. But at the same time, it's pretty surprising that they literally, he's like high on morphine in the lodge. They just leave him when the raptors come. They don't even make an effort to save him, really. Like, they do what they can for him and realize there's really no point in dragging him around, and they just kind of abandon him. I don't see why they couldn't have translated this over in some way by having a main character die other than the lawyer. Considering that more than a few people met their end in the book. I met, This might have been to secure the PG-13 rating, so that, I don't know, people could bring their kids in. But still, it's kind of weird for me. It's a really good movie, yeah, and it's an amazing book as well. They both have their flaws. They both have scientific errors. They both have errors in continuity, or at least the movie does. And a lot of it can be explained by comparing the two and seeing what was changed. And what they had to do to make it work better as a film than how it worked as a book. I like both versions, and at least read the book once. And you've probably already seen the movie. Everybody buddy has. I do hope to be reviewing the second movie in book soon. Like, I used to have a copy of The Lost World on tape, and I just don't have it anymore, so I'm gonna have to wait till it's on TV or something. But until then, I don't know what any of my plans for reviews are. I don't know if I'll have a lot of time for them, because, well, this is the only day I have off this week. Let's put it that way. I've been pretty busy. But with any luck, there should be more reviews coming up soon. I do apologize for all delays that are happening. And maybe I will talk about the third movie and the fourth one as well, if you want me to. Just so you can get a bit of a perspective of what I think on the rest of the series.